Welcome to another Tale of Woe. I am your storyteller, Tim, and once more we delve into the adventures of Warflower's Wagon of Wonders in the campaign of the beginning. In the previous episode, the party had managed to run riot through an entire stronghold filled with giants defeating them all and making uh, at the behest of a dragon making their way back to the dragon's den or the dragon's lair and only to find that the dragon was dead um at the hands of their arch nemesis i suppose you could call it or one of their nemesis nemeses uh grand duke moloch uh, once they found that what they were looking for had been taken by him, returning back into their wagon, they checked the world engine and discovered, uh, if they hadn't been paying attention beforehand, that the one of the locations that showed where the, um, uh, the different artifacts they were looking for had actually uh, moved location, and one location was slightly brighter now. Um, realizing this and gathering up uh, all that they can, uh, they piled into the wagon, set the world engine, and appeared on this island. And immediately as they land on this island, things go awry for them. Because this island had one unique property in that it was a volcanic island that spewed ash that um, had anti-magic properties. So the entire island was covered in an anti-magic field, provided you were touching parts of the the surface or the smoke. And so immediately as they arrive, all their magical equipment stopped working and the wagon is completely disabled. And this is the first time they actually got to see what the true interior of the wagon looked like. And I describe it, it's just like the interior of a Star Trek holodeck. It's all black with yellow lines. So all the interior was actually uh, holographic illusions. So all their equipment is still there, uh, all piled about the place and looking a lot less tidy, but now they see what the actual interior looks like. Realizing that they are in a bit of trouble and they weren't actually going to be able to get off, uh, they make their way out of the wagon and on the beach that uh, they discover on this island, it's completely covered in shipwrecks. There's jagged rocks, there's uh, sails, you know, uh, masts, uh, just broken ships everywhere. This place uh, looks like uh, no one has ever successfully arrived here and left. Every person that has arrived has arrived here uh, either through uh, no means of their own or no, no intention of, of their own or um, coming here intentionally not managed to make a safe uh, landing on the beaches. Um, realizing that all of their equipment was potentially in danger if there were people laying around, the party decided to split up. This was in part because Gieve wasn't actually around for this session. So they sent him a text, um, you know, out of game and said, what would you like to do? Would you like to come with them? We'll just use you as an NPC or would you like to stay behind and guard the wagon? And he opted to stay behind and guard the wagon. The rest of the group consisting of Nuru, Wallflower, Selena and uh, Jack, uh, stay, uh, they went on their, their journey up the mountain. Now, uh, this is where I had uh, picked up another module at this stage here, which I thought was really, really cool, and I felt that like I had to adapt this into my campaign. It was one of those things where I, I had an idea, but then this module came out, and I was like, oh, that's a much better idea, and so I adapted it in. And this module is actually an updated version of the Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, and it is called the Lost Laboratory of Qualsh or Qualish. You can get this uh, from D&D Beyond. It was uh, an adventure supporting Extra Life, one of the, the two that I know of. The other one, I believe, is the um, Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad or something of, along those lines, uh, which uh, I think we'll be getting to in uh, an episode further on down at the track. But this, th this storyline is really, really interesting. It... Uh, 
it, the, uh, the way that it, it plays out in the, the module itself is that a group of people are sent to find this lost laboratory of this gnome inventor known as Qualish or Qualsh. Um, and uh, your group is, is sent on this expedition where they find uh, in a um, in a ravine they find a floating island which is uh, this monastery known as the Monastery of the Distressed Body and there's all these very strange monks that live there and a, a weird demon-like entity that, that rules this place and that, that's just the first part of it and then the next part of it is they find a um, a city which uh, is completely covered in slime that used to be ruled by uh, Kenku, but um, somehow a portal to the the level of hell which was ruled over by the slime demons, I think the 10th level, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, yeah, so on, on this they've accidentally opened a portal and so this entire city is covered by a, a pool of living demonic slime. Uh, and then within this uh, this city um, exists the uh, the entrance to the laboratory. But that's the the actual mod module. But because this uh, module is actually an ex uh, a uh, updated variant on the expedition to the Barrier Peaks, I felt this was a perfect opportunity to uh, go into uh, more potential lore surrounding uh, the spaceship. Uh, that they found the equinox and the idea being that it wasn't the only one that crashed because these ships were arc ships maybe there was a fleet of them and a few of them didn't actually uh, uh, maybe a couple of them had crashed uh, due to uh, different circumstances one of them had landed on on the mainland and the other one had landed on this island albeit maybe you know years or even centuries apart depending on how the um, uh, their their travel went so when the group approaches the um the path they find signs that um are written in every language that they can think of is for some it's written in common celestial infernal uh gnome um it's even got in the language of the druids so someone has gone through and actually written this in every conceivable language and it says, uh, this way to the Monastery of the Distressed Beacon, because I thought it would be interesting that uh, the name um, over time had changed rather than being, um, you know, it's, it's a place setting off a distressed beacon. So this uh, place over time became the Monastery of the Distressed Beacon because they're keeping the beacon going. Uh, in order to be rescued, you know, how, like, similar, to, similar to, like, in um, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, how the the children that were the descendants of the people that crashed landed in the plane had made the entire uh, story of the crash and all the members of the crew had become uh, mythology and they built like a small religion around that this captain was the man who could you know he could capture the wind and and allow them to fly away to the magical place of the magical land that they were heading to which i think was vegas if i remember correctly but anyway so the monastery of the distressed beacon now uh i followed it uh pretty much for uh the um the most part, but as as always, when I'm adapting things, it took a few liberties. And the first encounter that they come across when they emerge through a cave, uh, in order to get to the monastery, they need to deal with a gynosphinx or a genosphinx, however you explain it. And the way they have um, described this this sphinx, it's actually a technologically enhanced sphinx. The Juno Sphinx appears to, have suffered, uh, appears to have suffered ancient injuries to its head, which have healed and been replaced by mechanical components. Both the creature's eyes are now glowing blue lenses, and its head is orbited by a number of spinning metallic devices. Entreat me, in, in, sorry, entreat with me, says the, says the Sphinx. If you wish to cross to the monastery, you do not appear entirely ignorant, and I look forward to adding whatever small knowledge you might possess to my collection. Now, the idea behind this Sphinx is it, it is meant to be a modified Sphinx, but 
the inverse of the way that sphinxes work. The idea being that you generally have to ask or answer the question that a sphinx puts to you. This sphinx has been enhanced and its brain has been um, adapted and, and uh, uh, so, uh, it's got cybernetic implants in its head. And as such, it knows everything, or at least it thinks it knows everything. And the way that it has been gaining additional knowledge is people have to ask it a question. And if it cannot answer the question, it will allow them to pass. But if they if it fails to answer the question, then uh, it takes something from them. Now, knowing that the group would most likely just fight it because they have a, uh, a distinct, um, especially Selena, has a um, uh, she likes her brain where it is and doesn't really feel like giving up uh, points of intelligence. Um, so uh, I, I modified it in saying that the prices of passage or the prices for failure in in this um, challenge to the Sphinx, you can bet either time, mind, or body. Now, they don't know what those mean, but in game terms, if they chose time, every time the Sphinx answered a question correctly, they would lose D4 weeks of their lives. So, and they, so they would transport forward D4 weeks of time because Sphinxes are able to manipulate the flow of time within their layer. So this platform where the Sphinx was bound counted as its layer, so it could put them forward in, in time. Uh, mind was they would lose a, uh, a point of intelligence off their their character sheet and this was part of what the the stones that were floating around the sphinx's heads these were actually iune stones of intelligence or at least they counted as such so because there was all these stones floating around its head every, every person that had um, given it a question it could answer and it took part of their intelligence until eventually they became feeble-minded and then you know, who knows what happened to them so all these stones floating around its head were bolstering its intelligence and body of course being the same thing as mind but you would lose uh, points in constitution so that was the price that they would have had to, they would have to pay in order to cross now i'll also show you this bit here this is the the map that or the image that it gives you so the party is here on this little dock and they have no way of getting across to the floating monastery. The monastery itself, uh, is, as it's described, you can see in the little images there, there's actually gouts of fire shooting out of this thing. It's actually held above the volcano. The volcano isn't active, um, but it's in the crater, and it's floating above um, the the base of the, uh, the, the, the floor of the volcano. So... They, they have no way of getting across, and so they need to um, beat the Sphinx's challenge. And they discuss it amongst themselves, and they decide that time will be uh, what they will choose. But again, they don't know what this means in terms of like how much time. Uh, and almost immediately after they agree on the terms, Nuru goes off and asks like six questions, six very, very easy questions like... Um, you know, is, is what we're looking for over there um, can you get us over there are you telling the truth just rattling off all of these questions and the thing was though that because it was answering the questions they were still paying the toll right because if, if, they answer, if, if it couldn't answer the question then they would get across for free but because she was rattling off the question she was paying the fee for them to get over 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 and over and over and over and over again and so i described as soon as she asks the question and the sphinx answers the question correctly to her the sky f blinks as you know it's the sun rotating over and over and over again but they don't realize what's actually happened and so by this stage they are now three months into the future and give is still in the past and so at this point, we'll stop it there, because they got onto uh, they got uh, a little hover platform came across, which they recognised from being uh, from the uh, the equinox when they were there last. It's one of the little um, hover dollies that they found in the cargo bay, um, and they um, 
they see uh, a person flying over on it, so they board onto it, and it takes them across the uh, the gap to the monastery. Cut back to Gieve. Now, the party is, like I said, they're three months in, into the future, so I had a private session with, uh, with Gieve in order to catch him up on what was happening, whether he was going to be just waiting around for the three months, or uh, uh, if he would go, go looking for them. And it took him, I think it was like a week. He waited a week uh, by the wagon, just uh, securing all of their treasure and making sure everything was all uh, okay. And then he finally decided to go looking for them. And, and he found the Sphinx. And uh, he chose time as well as the, the deciding factor. But he asked it a riddle. Uh, and the way that the, the game describes it is that uh, because this creature knows everything... Oh, that was the other, other bit. Sorry, sorry, forgot about it. Um, it doesn't actually give the name of the Sphinx, but I thought it would be humorous to call the Sphinx Google. So, <laughs> because one of the things it tells you is that uh, to make it more realistic, give yourself 30 seconds to look up the answer to the question on the internet and if you are able to do so in that 30 seconds then uh, you count as uh, being successful this is just to uh, offset your DM not being able to have the um, the infinite knowledge that a sphinx uh, would have for having a cybernetic brain so I actually got to physically use Google but unfortunately I was not quick enough to answer Gieve's question it was it was some some riddle and the answer turned out to be a kiss. I can't remember what the riddle actually was, but yeah, I was like three seconds too slow on finding the answer. So, Gieve outwitted the Sphinx and made his way across. And he's greeted uh, on the other side by um, a group of hooded monks, uh, all in red robes. And they're all yeah, very, very, very friendly and just saying, Welcome, you may. Yeah. Oh, I should actually describe this. The way that they talk was like this. Welcome to the Unister, <laughs> which, make, uh, uh, which makes sense uh, later on because he's not unable to see their faces, but none of the monks have faces because when you join this order, they actually flay your face off. And so they've just got um, muscle and, uh, and bone exposed. So it's, um, yeah, so because they don't have any, any cheeks, they talk like this. So, which made for some interesting role play for this whole situation. But Gieve uh, was un unsure, but he recognized what this place was. It was identical to the spaceship that he had been in previously, the Equinox, but it was far more run down. The entire place had been uh, gutted over over a long period of time. It was covered in rust. There were curtains and everything put up to make this place look more like a monastery, but it was most definitely a, a significantly more run-down portion of the um, the ship they had been to previously. The ship they had been in previously um, hadn't uh, been exposed to the open air, as it were. So, uh, But once they get to uh, the once he gets to the monastery, he spends time um, dicking around with the um, the monks, and the monks keep on insisting, "Would you like to meet the Lord? You know, the Lord is expecting you. you everyone who comes here must, you know, let uh, go see the uh, the Lord of of the um, uh, the distress beacon." But he's, you know, not really having any of it. But eventually, eventually. He goes up there, and he is uh, somewhat surprised to see that sitting um, in uh, a throne room, which was once the bridge of this ship, and mind you, he hasn't seen the bridge because the uh, previous ship didn't have a bridge. Uh, it, it actually landed on it, so it wasn't able to... Um, uh, it wasn't intact. But So he, fi and he finds that sitting on the throne... Um, that is a large golden statue to his likeness is Grand Duke Moloch. And Moloch has him imprisoned and uh, captured, imprisoned and taken down to the uh, engine room, which when they get into the, uh, the pneumatic tube 
to uh, to go down, they say, to the divine engine. This becomes important later on. Uh, when he gets within the divine engine, he sees his place is sweltering hot and there is bunches of um, black stone uh, all over this place that slaves are just shoveling into these furnaces um, to uh, somehow keep the... Um, the ship floating above the ground uh, and in the center of this monstrosity is a device that doesn't look like it belongs there and Moloch straps Geeve into this device and switches it on and Geeve's body withers away and he dies and then Geeve wakes up in the cloning laboratory of this ship and after he's recovered again, Moloch the next day takes him down, straps him into this machine, and kills him again. And kills him again, and again, and again. Because Moloch, being incredibly angry with these people, had a plan for them. And his plan was to perpetually kill them over and over again in order to siphon away their life energy, their soul energy, into this large device that they didn't know what it did yet and in fact they they don't think they ever really found out because of what happened next in the story so at one stage uh, when Geeve wakes up in his cell he actually manages to find a way out he attacks one of the monks and steals his robes and so he is now wandering around the ship in disguise and he gets caught up with a group of other monks and they get in the tube and they go up to Moloch's um, throne room once again and Geeve is standing there you know, being all, all silent and um, as Moloch is getting ready to c come down to pick him up again, Geeve steps into the, uh, the tube and says, take me to engineering and the other guards go engineering who are you stop that man and so he shoots down the tube and these two other people shoot down the tube these are um two of uh, moloch's bodyguards they dive down the tube and they chase him down so Ge so initiative is rolled and Geeve has I think, like two rounds in order to um uh, do whatever it is he's going to do in the ship and for those two rounds, he manages to, like, using some spells and other other bits of bits and pieces. He wasn't able to find any of his equipment that had been stripped away from him, but using uh, the bits and pieces that he had, um, managed to destroy the machine that he'd been he'd been constantly being strapped into. So it was done. It the um, and um, the way that uh, I'd written it into the plot is that this device couldn't be repaired once it was destroyed. So Geeve had managed to single-handedly once more ruin Moloch's master plan. And once they got down there, they zap him with the shock stick. Actually, that's one thing I probably should have explained too, is that all of these monks have um, taser prods. And because they have the chip in the back of their necks, if they get zapped with the prod, it automatically shuts them down. They go unconscious with one hit. That's how um, he was so easily subdued the first time when he had all of his equipment. They managed to just, pss, they tapped him out. Uh, and Geeve wakes up, stripped completely naked and floating in one of the cells uh, in uh, the prison. Uh, and uh, was ev uh, ever so often brought down to continue to shovel coal because Moloch uh, still wanted him to suffer. And he was pretty significantly tortured um, for the next couple of months until the rest of the party arrived after him, after he left. Time travel. So, when the rest of the group arrive at the Monastery of the Distressed Beacon, it is very much the same, except that Moloch no longer has a grand master plan for them, because Geeth so, sorted that problem out pretty significantly and so uh, but they are once again greeted by the, the friendly monks and they are brought to um, the, bri 
the bridge and they see who it is. And he says, well, part of you have managed to ruin my plans. I'm not going to make the same mistake with you. Take them. And so his bodyguards fall in and as does he and the fight is immediately on. And the interesting thing about the... Um, uh, Moloch's bodyguards. Now, again, I modified the storyline in this original book. In the original book, the main demon boss is actually a, a bone devil who's wearing a coat made up of all of the faces of the uh, people that have come to the monastery. And he has two bodyguards, which are devils as well. And they have uh, divide, um, weapons on them. One of them is the Blade of the Medusa, and the other is the Blade of... Where is it? The Blade of the Medusa and, and the... Oh, the, bl the Blade of Polymorph. And the way that it works is that if you get a critical hit on someone with the Blade of Polymorph, it has a random chance... It'll, it'll randomly polymorph you into a creature. Uh, anything from a rat to a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So, uh, that happened, and then you've also got the Blade of the Medusa, same way, but if you get a critical hit on someone, it will turn them to stone like a Medusa does. So, the fight uh, immediately goes on with the group, and they're dealing with the two, um, the two bodyguards, and also dealing with Moloch. But they found, interestingly enough, that when they hit him with lightning damage, he would stun, like all the constructs that they've had to deal with in... Um, in the previous uh, encounters with, with the different constructs. And when they uh, finally uh, managed to uh, take him down, because he wasn't, that, he wasn't anywhere near as scary as they expected him to be, and with good reason, because when they kill him, he doesn't burst into flame or disappear, he just goes limp, and they hear like a, a, the sound of like mechanical device whirring down. And when um, they manage to dispatch the two bodyguards, they see flying out from the rear of this body, um, this robot body that was made up to look like Grand Duke Moloch, is an imp. This imp is, in fact, Grand Duke Moloch. Because he has been cut off from his source of power, which is the Hells, he... Uh, his power had diminished and his form had shrunk down and he'd become an imp. And so in order to maintain his power, he had created uh, a suit of um, a suit of armor, a robotic suit using the technology of the ship in order to uh, to maintain his imposing presence. But his plan also was that he had a new body that he was planning to use, but this required life energy in order to power it, because he had um, discovered uh, someone who was able to um, capture life energy and use it as an actual power source. And so he needed uh, the life energy of the members of the party, because they need to have the chip implants in order for them to be siphoned off with this specific device. Uh, they needed him, they needed them to he needed them to power up his suit. But because Geev had smashed the power core, he couldn't do that anymore. So his suit was completely underpowered, and his new suit wasn't going to be able to be constructed. So once the imp had gotten out, the party managed to corner it behind the, uh, the statue of himself, the golden glorious visage, as you can see up there, of... Grand Duke Moloch and they crush Grand Duke Moloch and their nemesis is defeated. But that wasn't the end of the story because they still have a massive group of monks in this place as well as um, the slaves to deal with. And so... They gather up what equipment they can. They uh, gather some of the monks, shock prods and other bits of equipment and they make their way back down to the... Um, they make their way... or well, attempt to make their way down into the... 
Actually, no, tell a lie. Let me just start again there. So after they defeat Moloch, they are surrounded by the monks. And because most of them have the chips, they get shock prodded and they get knocked out and they get captured. Now, because they have defeated the Dark Lord, um, the monks no longer have any leaders. So they just go back to doing their routine. So they once again, they beat up the party, they stripped them of all their equipment, and then they put them to work in the slave rotation. And one of the slaves that they discover on their journey uh, down into the, uh, the depths is Nuru's twin brother, Nara. But his brain has been broken, he's been pretty badly tortured all of this time. Um, but you know, family reunion, and Nuru is, is very excited. This ve And this very much um, increases her resolve in order to escape. Uh, with a few successful lockpicking and sleight-of-hand checks with hidden lockpicks that um, Nuru had managed to secure or secrete on her person, uh, they broke free of the chains, they managed to grab the shock poles, overpower the few guards that were in the engine room, and using their knowledge of the interior of the ship, they were able to uh, basically get to the, um, the medical bay and the security office. The medical bay in this instance has been turned into an abattoir. It's the place where the monks go to have their faces removed. So if you become a member of the Order of the Distressed Beacon, they take you to the um, the medical bay and the broken up surge robot uh, immediately grabs you, throws you down on the table and tries to remove your face. So they manage to overpower um, the android and stop their faces from being removed. Um, the science lab have been completely gutted and uh, they, they're they looking for weapons and other bits and pieces but they find their way into the um, uh, the security room because they still have their access cards from their own ship which work universally across the ship so they were able to um, make their way through the ship and they reunite with Gieve and because they um they are fairly certain they know where their equip equipment is being stored because they spoke to some of the other members of the um, the captive party. It's been held on a small floating island across um, a series of... Uh, what's the word for it? Uh, flo uh, tensors floating disks. It's like a bridge of tensors floating disks. And there is um, a, a vault where all of the, the valuable items are being stored. And so they decides because um, Nuru's brother is not as switched on as he could be, they leave him behind in the core, right, not, right next to where Darius would have been on board uh, the Equinox. Uh, but unfortunately, this was the worst ever possible place they could have left him. Because Moloch had decided that... If he was going to fade out of existence, this was not acceptable to him. And so he found a way to upload his consciousness into the artificial intelligence system of this ship. Now, the ship wasn't able to be connected to anything because the network was down, but the computer was still functional. And so Moloch was literally, his consciousness was literally in the computer, in the room, right next to where they left Nuru's brother. But they didn't know that at the time because they couldn't get into the room. And so after they left to go and secure their equipment, the door opens and Nuru's brother wanders into that room and the door shuts. And so as quick as a family reunion as that was, it appears that the tragedy was not yet over for... Nuru and her family and Moloch's revenge was yet to be completed because this man had plans on top of plans so